God says, someone's going to come who's anointed to preach good news to the poor. In verse 2, this person is going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's going to sound the trumpet. He's going to bring in the jubilee that has never once happened in all the history of Israel. Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. I'm David Pick. And Colin, that raises the question, God said that was going to happen, but it didn't actually happen. Why was that? Well, because it was so costly. I mean, this to me is one of the marvelous stories of the Old Testament. God's law that every seven years, all debts were to be released, all slaves were to be set free, and all inheritances that had been lost were to be restored. This is to happen. But people aren't going to do that because it's going to cost too much. And so all through the history of the Old Testament, these wonderful, wonderful laws that reflect God's compassion for the poor and for those in need, they're never enacted. And until Jesus Christ comes into the world and says, I'll do it because I'm prepared to pay the price, which of course he did. And so this speaks to us today about how marvelous the grace of God is. It shines the light on just how much Jesus Christ has done and why he's different from any other person who's ever lived. And because of that, we have a hope which you're going to see in our message today. So I hope you'll be able to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 61 as we begin our message, Restore Hope. Here's Colin. Today we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 61 and 63 at two visions of our Lord Jesus Christ that are recorded there. The first in chapter 61 tells us what has happened through his coming into the world. And the second in chapter 63 tells us what will happen when he comes again in power and in glory. Now, I want us to see then the two visions of Jesus Christ that are given to Isaiah the prophet. The first is that we find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is our marvelous, compassionate Savior. That's where your hope begins, and that's where mine begins too. Notice what Isaiah says, chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom from the captives, release from darkness for prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, you need to know one or two things from the Bible in order to understand what Isaiah is talking about. Back earlier in the Old Testament, God had given some marvelous laws for the protection of the poor. Now, if you're ever in a discussion with someone who is antagonistic towards Christianity, this is the sort of thing that you need to know and to bring out in that discussion. Did you know that in God's law in the Old Testament, every seven years, all debts were to be canceled? That's Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 1. Imagine if that happened in this country. How many people would be happy if Visa and MasterCard every seven years canceled all debts, just wrote them off, said we're back to zero? It's hard to imagine, isn't it? That's what God's law said was to happen in Israel. Second, every seven years, all slaves were to be released. That's Leviticus chapter 25 and also chapter 15. This was very important because, of course, when some people were in a position of being unable to pay off debt, and they were still within the seven-year period, what they would do in order to honorably fulfill their commitment was that they would work for someone to whom they owed money. They would sell their labor, in other words, as a way of paying off their debt. Now, God honored this as a reasonable way for a person to maintain their integrity and to fulfill their responsibilities. But God said... That kind of service, the paying off debt kind of service, is never to last more than seven years. Now, it's a fascinating thing that God created the cycle, the seven-year cycle, in order to protect the poor. See, however much you redistribute wealth in any society, there will always be some who make better use of it and some who make worse use of it. So that if in America today we could give everyone exactly the same resource, seven years from now, some would have more and some would have less. Some would steward it well, some would steward it poorly. 
And therefore, the problem of poverty is always with us. There will always be a need that is recognized in the law of God to relieve the particular needs of the poor. That's why Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. This will always be an issue in human society. And God's law provides for the relief of compassion towards help for the poor in a radical way. All debts canceled, all slaves released every seven years. By the way, you know the kind of person who wants to blame Christians for everything? And have you ever heard someone say, you know, well, Christianity, of course, that just supports slavery? If you, if you get that, you just say to that person, what do you think of God's anti-slavery laws in the Old Testament? Guarantee you they'll look blank, and then you can point them to the book of Leviticus and say, actually, the law of God is uniquely, in any culture, directed towards the relief of poverty and towards the help of those who've got themselves tied up and bound in situations they cannot get out of. There never was any other culture either then or since, that has had any laws remotely like this. They are marvelous laws for the relief of the poor. Only the God of the Bible would legislate like this. Now, there's a third law, the relief of all debt, the release of all slaveries. There's a third law that was the best of all. And here I'd like to invite you to turn back to Leviticus in chapter 25 so that you can see it for yourself. This is the law that related to the year of Jubilee. It's Leviticus in chapter 25, and it begins in verse 8. And you notice that God says there, count off seven Sabbaths of years. In other words, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. So there's this cycle in which debt is relieved and slaves are released every seven years, and God says this is now to happen seven times, and that takes you to 49 years. Then, verse 9, have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout the land, consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his own family property. And you can read on the legislation about this remarkable jubilee year that God said was to happen among His people once every lifetime, once every 50 years. Now, the significance of this was that, of course, when God's people came into the promised land, you remember God gave to each tribe and each family a portion of the land. There was land that was given to each family, tribe, clan, apportioned by God as their inheritance. Over the years, it would, in the course of life, become necessary for some folks to sell their land. But once in every lifetime, on the 50th year, God says the land must be returned to the original owners. It must go back to the family of origin. It must go back to the line to which it was given by God. And what that meant, of course, was that land in Israel could only be owned on a leasehold basis. And if you want to follow it through, you'll see in verses 15, 16, and 17 how this worked. What it meant was that the value or the price of a piece of land was determined by where you were in the 50-year cycle. If you were in year 47, 48, or 49, then the price of lands being sold would be quite low because it would only be one, two, or three years until it went back to the seller, and therefore only a few years of crops before it returned. If land was being sold a couple of years after the Jubilee, the price would be much higher because there would be, you know, 48, 49, 50 years of crops uh, that could be raised on that land before it would be returned. And so verse 15, God says, you're to buy from your countrymen on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee. Verse 16, when the years are many, you increase the price. When the years are few, you decrease the price because what you're really selling is the number of crops. The land always ultimately belonged to God. 
So verse 17, don't take advantage of each other, but fear your God. I am the Lord, your God. Now put these together. Every seven years, you blank out all debts. Every seven years, you release all slaves. And once in every lifetime, once every 50 years, land that has been bought or sold all returns to the original family of origin, the original owners. These are marvelously compassionate laws. They placed a check among God's people on the growing power of those who had accumulated wealth. They made sure that the children of wealthy people did not kind of float through life on massive accumulated inheritance, but rather had to find their own way and earn like everybody else. And they gave a new start, most of all, to the poor and the oppressed, and it happened once in every lifetime. Now, I want us to understand here that no other culture had laws remotely like this. No other country has ever had laws like these. But God says to His people, you're my people, and this is what I'm telling you to do. Now, let's take a step back. How would you have liked to live under these laws? See, you've got to think about that because a lot depends on whether you would happen to be a borrower or whether you would happen to be a lender. These laws were great for debtors, but these laws were incredibly costly for creditors. Now, God gave these laws to Moses, remember, for his Old Testament people when they were in the land of Israel, and he's telling them what they're to do when they inherit the promised land coming into Canaan. And he says, when you come into the promised land, here is what you are to do. Every 50 years, sound the trumpet and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, how often do you think this happened? Answer? Never. Nada. Not once. Not once. A couple of great Hebrew historians who have done great research into this make this comment in a book, The Feasts of the Lord. There is no historical record either in the Bible or beyond the Bible of Israel ever once observing the Jubilee year. And it's not difficult to work out why, is it? The folks with the power were also the folks with the money. It always seems to work out like that. And when the folks with the power who are also the folks with the money look at what the Jubilee is actually going to cost them, they say, let's not sound the trumpet. We'll do it in seven years. And so the trumpet never sounded. God's people never once obeyed this law. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith and our message today called Restore Hope is part of a wider series called Restore My Soul. And if you've missed any of the series or you'd like to go back and listen again, I'd encourage you to do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. There you can hear any of the messages which have already gone out on air. You'll also find us now as a podcast on your favourite podcast site. Either follow the link on our website or go to directly to your favourite podcast site, search for Open the Bible UK and subscribe to receive regular updates. Back to the message now. We're in Isaiah 61 and here's Colin. So by the time of Isaiah, understand that God's people had now been in the land 700 years. So by the time of Isaiah, there should have been 14 different jubilees. And there hadn't been a single one. The trumpet had never sounded. The year of God's favor was never proclaimed, which is why the Old Testament prophets are so scathing on the way in which the rich were oppressing the poor. They simply systematically ignored the law of God when it was going to be costly to them. Now, none of this should surprise us. Because you only need to think about the implementation of these laws, and you quickly realize they could only work in a community of people who really loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved their neighbor as much as themselves. And Old Testament Israel wasn't that society. And there never has been a culture where this has been put into operation. 
What God's perfect law does is it shows us our own inner selfishness. It shows us what we really are, and it proves how much we need to be redeemed. So now back to Isaiah 61. And as the poor are oppressed, and as the insensitivity towards their need continues generation after generation, God says, someone's going to come who's anointed to preach good news to the poor, In verse 2, this person is going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's going to sound the trumpet. He's going to bring in the jubilee that has never once happened in all the history of Israel. Well, of course, that raises the question, who's he talking about? Well, now would you turn forward in your Bible to Luke's gospel in chapter 4? This will be familiar to many of us, I think. Luke's gospel and chapter 4. Because it's very significant that the Lord Jesus Christ chose these words from Isaiah to launch his own public ministry. Chapter 4 and verse 17, try and picture the setting. The Lord Jesus Christ is in the synagogue. And verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is handed to Jesus. Unrolling it, he finds, so he chose the reading, He finds the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to proclaim, verse 19, the year of God's favor. So Jesus applies this to Himself. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, He's saying, to proclaim the year of God's favor, to bring in the jubilee that has never once been known in all the history of God's people. Then, follow what it says, Jesus rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began, first public utterance of Jesus, he began by saying, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's marvelous. Christ says, they haven't proclaimed the jubilee once. And you know what? They never will, but I will do it. I have come to proclaim the year of God's favor. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have come to do for you what you would never do for each other, to cancel every debt that you owe to God, to set you free from the slavery that you know to the power of sin and Satan, and to give back to you the inheritance that Adam lost, that is the inheritance of joy and life in his presence forever and forever. That is the promise of the gospel. It is the most marvelous good news. But remember, when you think about the year of God's favor that is such a blessing to us that we celebrate in our worship every week, comes at incredible cost to him. If you write off a debt, you incur a loss in the amount of that debt yourself. And when Jesus comes to proclaim the jubilee and to write off all our debts towards God, it means that God is incurring that debt in himself. And this is why Jesus went to the cross. He bore the loss to cancel our debts, to set us free, and to restore our inheritance. God canceling debts, God freeing slaves, God restoring inheritances in Christ. That's the gospel. Now, I want you to notice, and this is marvelous when you see it, I want you to notice if you look between Luke chapter 4 and back to Isaiah chapter 61, I want you to notice where Jesus stopped in his reading on that Sabbath when he inaugurated his public ministry. Let's look at chapter 61 and verse 2. The anointed one will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Turn over to Luke chapter 4, and you see where Jesus stopped to proclaim verse 19 the year of the Lord's favor, period. 
In other words, when Jesus was reading from the scroll, he stopped mid-sentence. He stopped halfway through what Isaiah was saying. Now you say, why in all the world, when Jesus was choosing the reading, did he stop in the middle of a sentence and say, I come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? Why didn't he finish the sentence? Because he went on to say, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And thank God that when Jesus came into the world, born as a baby, through his death and through his resurrection, he brought in the year of the Lord's favor. He did not at that time bring in the day of God's vengeance. I say thank God for that, because if Jesus had brought in the day of God's vengeance in his first coming into the world, none of us would be here today. The world as we know it would have ended 2,000 years ago in a blitz of God's judgment. So Jesus stops halfway through what Isaiah says, mid-sentence. I'm the compassionate Savior that's coming to bring this freedom from debt and release from slavery to sin and to restore inheritance. You say, well, what about the day of God's vengeance? Well, Jesus spoke about that too. John chapter 5 and verse 28, he said, a time is coming when those who are in their graves will hear the voice of God, and those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Jesus said that time is coming. It has not come yet. So, Isaiah sees this coming anointed one bringing both the year of God's favor and the day of God's vengeance, almost like looking at a mountain, and you think it's one mountain. Actually, it's two mountains, one behind the other, and we're living right in between times in the day of God's favor, not yet having reached the day of God's vengeance. What a great reminder there that our hope as Christians is in Jesus Christ. He is our compassionate Savior. And that's the first part of our message, Restore Hope. It's a part of our series, Restore My Soul, and if you've missed any of the series, do feel you can come back and listen again on our website. That's openthebible.org.uk. Or search out our podcast. That's available on any of the podcasting sites. Just search for Open the Bible UK. Also on our website is Open the Bible Daily, and that's a series of short two- to three-minute reflections based on Pastor Collins' teaching and read in the UK by Sue McLeish. And I hope you'll be able to join us next time for the second part of Restore Hope. Open the Bible is supported entirely by our listeners, and if that's something you've been considering doing, then this month we have a great offer for you. If you're able to set up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible in the amount of £5 per month or more, we'd love to say thank you by sending you a copy of C.H. Spurgeon's book, Encouragement for the Depressed. Colin, who is this book for? Well, this book is really for anyone who is discouraged or going through a dark time. And I can't imagine that there's any Christian who doesn't experience that at some point in life. What's so striking to me about this uh, book is that it's written by a man who was known for his extraordinary faith. I mean, the Spirit of God rested on the life and ministry of C.H. Spurgeon, and yet he knew what it was to go through times of extraordinary darkness and even a sense of despair at some points. You know, he suffered from smallpox, gout, rheumatism, inflammation of the kidneys, and his wife was bedridden for decades. I mean, this man really knew what it was to suffer, and yet he found in all of this that he was forced closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what he says. He says, I, I've learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. I love that. Kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. Here's biblical wisdom from a man of faith who knew what it was to really struggle in dark times. And I have found his writing to be wonderfully encouraging, refreshing, and uplifting. And that's why I'm really grateful that we have the opportunity of getting this book out this month. C.H. Spurgeon's book, Encouragement for the Depressed, is our gift to you if you are able to set up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible this month in the amount of £5 per month or more. 
Full details and to give online, go to our website, openthebible.org.uk. For Open the Bible and Pastor Colin Smith, I'm David Pick, and I hope you'll join us again next time. One of the laws God gave Israel was never kept, and nor could it be kept today. Find out why and what God did about it. That's next time on Open the Bible.